Um, so today you will be getting a welcome kind of overview from our CEO, Greg Petoniak. He'll be um, kind of explaining SEMCA and the region and the organization that we are. Um, and then he will be handing it off to Colleen Mallory, our business services manager, um, who will be giving you an overview of our business services, um, the things we have to offer beyond the Going Pro Talent Fund. And then she will be handing it off to Andrea Chavez Ainsworth, uh, who will be presenting the Going Pro Talent Fund with me. I'm Trevor Verrier. Um, I am the associate program manager and the key contact for the Going Pro Talent Fund. So without further ado, uh, I will hand it over to you, Greg. Thank you, Trevor. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us in this informational webinar on Going Pro Talent Fund. So uh, you may be wondering, who is Semca Michigan Works? Well, we are one of 16 Michigan Works agencies in the state of Michigan, officially designated by the federal and state government as a uh, workforce development board and uh, to administer workforce development programs in, in our re region. And we are a 501c3 nonprofit established in 1996. Um, and and it, it is an organization created and led by your community and business leadership. It is a formal partnership of Monroe and Wayne counties, the Conference of Western Wayne, the Down River Community Conference, and the Conference of Eastern Wayne. That formal partnership is the governing board for our organization, and they appoint the Workforce Development Board, of which a majority of the members are from the private sector, which is very important to help inform us on what um, our employer and industry needs and talent in workforce development. As a designated Workforce Development Board, um, we operate six Michigan Works American Job Centers throughout the region. And um, one other important tidbit to share with you because we're very proud of it and it speaks to our commitment to continuous improvement. Every three years, we seek voluntarily to get accredited by a national entity called the National Council on Accreditation. We, we make this commitment because we want to be very uh, up to date on our business practices and our policies and, and, and again, maintain a, a, a path of, of constant improvement within our organization. Every three years, we also go through a strategic planning process involving our boards, our, our um, staff, um, our, our business partners, as well as, as uh, some of our constituencies. And these two statements provide you with our, our most recent strategic plan mission statement, which is to provide innovative leadership to create inclusive, lifelong talent and career development system that is responsive to labor market and industry demands. And with a vision that through SEMCA's leadership, there is a robust career and talent pipeline sustained by public and private partnerships, driving a resilient, vital, and competitive economy. So um, there are three categories of customers for us. One, of course, is job seekers, those who may have lost a job or simply want to look for another job. Um, we can assist them with that, and um, along the way, we provide them with career advising um, and, and may even support them with, uh, with additional training to upskill to meet the needs of, of uh, in-demand occupations in our region. And, and we learn about those in-demand in, in occupations by working with our employers. We consider employers a very important customer. Um, and indeed, Going Pro Talent Fund is targeted to assist employers substantially with um, incumbent worker training, um, and but you are our are, are eyes and ears for helping us better serve um, job seekers. Lastly, um, you're, speaking of incumbent workers, um, your employees are also important to us uh, as customers in, in ways that we work with you to help upskill and train them. And again, Going Pro Talent Fund is an excellent opportunity to do that. And we have other programs that can support your employees to help them remain productive in, in, in your workspace. So please understand we're not a state organization. We are constantly evolving um, with and adapting to the new economy. Uh, we have a greater commitment than ever to career pathway awareness for youth and adults. Some of you may be from industries where not many youth are saying, oh, I wanna go into that industry. Um, and so, and as you know, many, Many of them would be interested if they knew more information about your career pathways. 
We also limit our training funding to achieving credentials in, in high demand occupations only. Uh, we don't want to expand public funds in a direction that um, misleads an individual and limits, uh, 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 in, in inefficiently spends the funds um, in, a, in a way they cannot get uh, hired. Finally, we have a, a greater commitment than ever to developing work-based learning options. If you're at all interested in apprenticeships, um, um, uh, we are uh, can be a great partner in that space. And I'm sure um, Colleen will cover that in greater detail. But thank you again for joining us, and I hope you find this uh, webinar informative. Take care. Great, thanks, Greg. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I know you're all here and anxious to hear about the Going Pro Talent Fund, but I just wanted to let you know about some additional service services that we have available to you um, that can help you with your talent recruitment and other talent development options. So we are able to provide employers with research um, information on labor market, including any sort of wage data. We can help you write any job descriptions for new occupations you may be uh, need um, at your organization. We can post those on the Pure Michigan Talent Connect website, and then we distribute those postings to our network, which includes our community organization partners, as well as our case managers who work directly with our job seekers. Um, we can host uh, recruiting events, either virtually or in person at our American Job Centers. And in addition to that, um, we can use our space uh, for onboarding or orientations or testing of any of your new hires. And then we can pre-screen applicants for you if it becomes burdensome or there's a lot, and we can assist you in that if you have a smaller sort of HR department. We have access to no cost fidelity bonding. So if you wanna um, ensure uh, your current or new workers um, will not be a liability to you, we can do that if you're looking at those hard to um, serve type of job seeker to fill positions, whether they're returning citizens or something like that, we can help you with that process. For talent development um, and retention, um, in addition to the Going Pro Talent Fund, we also help um, with funding to support any new hire training through our on-the-job training program, um, as well as current programs. We have grants from a variety of um, resources, whether it's the state of Michigan or Department of Labor, that we may be able to assist you with. As Greg spoke about, uh, we do have funding available to help employers uh, off the cost of starting an apprenticeship program, as well as funding to help offset the cost of training those apprentices, whether it's reimbursement for their classroom training or offsetting their um, on-the-job learning. We also have the Business Resource Network. That's an opportunity for employers to have career coaches come into your uh, companies and work directly with your employees to help them retain employment and overcome barriers from continuing to uh, go get to work. So it could be anything from housing assistance, car repair, child care. Um, we can meet with them and help overcome some of those burdens so you can retain the great talent that you already have. Um, all right, so that's my little portion. If you're interested in any of those other services, you'll see a link to our feedback form um, in the chat. We'll also put it in there again at the end of the session. So you'll see on that questionnaire that there's an opportunity to mark if you want more information on those services I just spoke about. All right, great. I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea and she will uh, take away the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Colleen. Um, already, everybody, uh, let's go over a little bit about the Going Pro Talent Fund. Um, so the purpose of this program is to provide competitive awards to employers to assist in training, development, and retaining current and new employees. Um, this also helps to ensure that Michigan employers have the talent they need to compete and grow, um, and individuals have the skills they need for in-demand jobs. Um, this program is a reimbursement program. I always like to start off by saying that. So yes, employers do pay for the training and then it's a reimbursement program throughout the cycle um, and you do submit that to us. Um, it is available to private sector employers in Michigan um, and it is awarded on a competitive basis. Um, so this is actually a pretty highly competitive reimbursement program, um, and it is a statewide program. So it's not just businesses locally that you're competing for. It can be all the way up to the UP. 
Um, it seems like each cycle uh, that this program goes through, uh, the demand uh, is increasing each cycle. Um, and then you must apply within the application window. Um, so for this upcoming um, cycle, that's going to be October 1st through the 18th of 2024. Um, and we have a little blue asterisk here. Um, this indicates that there is something new that the state has changed for this upcoming year. So if you are familiar with the program, um, please make sure to uh, listen to those as these are new for this upcoming cycle. Um, so let's move on to the strategy of the Going Pro Fund. Um, so it is designed to create uh, public-private partnerships with businesses to develop training modules that adapt in real time with changing employers and demand. So all training must be completed within one year from the date of the award and lead to a credential for a skill that is transferable and recognized by an industry. Um, so again, this cycle, that's going to be January 1st through December 31st of 2025. Um, so employers who request funding must actively participate in the development of the training plan and commit to retaining individuals at the completion of the training. Um, no worries on that training plan. You do have the support from the business service representatives along with a couple of us at SumCut to assist you. Um, so the new jobs created as a result of training should be filled by individuals recruited with the assistance of the local Michigan Works Agency. Um, and additionally, due to the challenges finding the skilled talent uh, to fill jobs, uh, companies are encouraged to expand their recruitment to include individuals within targeted populations. Um, so targeted populations are going to be uh, like veterans, um, older workers, uh, returning citizens, um, individuals with disabilities, and those on the public assistance programs. So uh, let's go into who are the eligible employers of this. So that's going to be the non-government, private sector, for-profit or not-for-profit companies and organizations. Um, the employer must have a need for a skill enhancement, including apprenticeship programs and advanced tech programs for current employees or new employees. Um, you mo must also have a Michigan presence. So you might uh, be a company that has multiple locations statewide. Um, so you must make sure that there is a Michigan presence for your company and the training is only for those in your Michigan buildings. Um, you must be compliant with all federal and state tax obligations, including but not limited to corporate, sales, use, withholding, personal income, and unemployment insurance taxes. Um, Leo does verify this information, um, but don't worry, just having a tax obligation does not hold you back from applying, um, but if you're awarded, you will have about 60 days from the award date to clear those tax obligations. Um, you also must be willing to participate under the project's eligibility parameters and guidelines. Um, so this program, the cycle is a year, so just know we will be following up for um, probably about a year, year and a half, up to two, just depending on the completion dates of your trainings. Um, so please be prepared that this program does last a little bit. Um, and last but not least, uh, public institutions or entities are not eligible to apply. So no quasi public private entities, even if you're a nonprofit 401c3. So these are going to be like county road commissions, um, municipally owned utilities, federally qualified health centers, and community mental health authorities. Um, so let's go over who are the eligible employees. Um, so there are two types of employees that may receive um, the talent training. Um, the first is going to be what we call current employees. So that's individuals on the employer's payroll at the time of the application or has been previously employed uh, by the employer. So blue asterisk. So a little um, things have changed with the current employee's definition from the state. Um, so again, um, these are those that were on your payroll at the time of the application or hired at least 31 days prior to the award date. Um, this current employees do include those that were promoted or moved within a different position. So um, even if they are promoted or moved into a different position, the state recognize that as a current employee. Um, this also pertains to those that move from part time to full time, um, those that you may have laid off, furloughed or fired and then rehired. Um, they will count them as a current employee. Um, and last but not least, those that have worked for you through like temporary staffing agencies, leasing agencies, or a contract with a Form 1099. 
Um, so newly hired employees, um, those are going to be individuals hired at 30 days prior to on or after the award date. Um, so regardless of current or new employee status, all employees must be permanent full-time employees. Uh, so we count full-time as 32 hours per week or more. Um, individuals who work in Michigan for whom the employer pays all the applicable taxes to the state of Michigan, regardless of where the employee lives. Um, so for example, you may have an employee that lives, let's say in Ohio and drives to Monroe. Um, as long as you pay all the applicable taxes for that employee, they would be eligible for training. Um, they have to be 18 years of age or older. A U.S. citizen or legally authorized to work in the United States. Um, and those that are not eligible would be seasonal or part-time employees. Um, questions? Does anybody have any questions for me? Nope. Okay. I guess I'll move on. All righty. So the next one is going to be, uh, let's talk a little bit about the training. Um, so the training itself should be utilized to provide short term um, to meet current um, documented needs of the employers. Um, so no single training should exceed more than six months. Um, all classroom and customized training and apprenticeship training must conclude within one year from the award date. Um, so again, that's going to be January 1st through December 31st of 2025. Um, new employee on the job training, including the 90 post day retaining retention period, must be completed within one year from the award date. Um, we'll go over how this works in a different slide, um, but just so you're aware that new employees with on the job training, uh, it's retention based, um, and just making sure that that doesn't go over the December 31st, uh, 2025 date. Um, okay, so let's go over the eligible training uh, provider partners. So uh, that's going to be Michigan community colleges and universities, um, private training providers, um, training providers identified by and agreed upon all partners who can do accelerated just-in-time training. Um, that's also going to be for the registered United States Department of Labor Joint Apprenticeship uh, Training Centers. Um, that's JATCs. Um, vendors providing training and operation of equipment or systems for which they are the provider for, proprietary schools as licensed in the state of Michigan. Um, the preference, of course, is to have all trainings occur in Michigan, um, but however, uh, we may be able to assist you with out-of-state uh, training as well um, if there is a documented need and rationale, which we would get at the beginning of the uh, award cycle. Um, so new this year, um, employers are no longer eligible to be the training providers outside of on-the-job training. Um, so what that means is um, if you created, let's say, a widget um, and your company is the one that has it, uh, nobody else in the world has this, and you wanted to provide your employees training on that, um, unfortunately, you no longer can be reimbursed for that. Um, you can still do on-the-job training with your newly hired or USDOL um, employees, uh, but you can't get the classroom customized training. So that is something new this year. Um, so let's go over the three different types of training that can be used for your company. Um, the first is going to be classroom or customized training. Um, this may be used for current or new employees, um, must lead to a credential for a skill that is transferable and recognized by the industry. Um, this credential should allow the individual to retain employment or in the off chance uh, case that they become unemployed to gain employment in a shorter time frame. Um, it must be conducted by a third party, um, may take place at the training provider site or on the site at the employer's. Um, this may take place online, um, but you must provide rationale to support online learning. Um, and this online learning needs to um, be synchronous. So it's instructor led at like a specific place of specific time. It can't be those um, online at your own pace trainings or those asynchronous trainings. Um, so we will go over uh, next the eligible and ineligible training uh, handout, which would hopefully help with some of this. Um, so this first one with the eligible training examples, um, just know that um, it's just examples. So this is not 
um, meant to be an all-inclusive training list, um, but hopefully this gives you a rough idea of the trainings that are eligible um, for this cycle. Uh, we do have this available for you. Um, and then the next one goes over our ineligible trainings. Um, again, these are just examples. Um, but if you notice with the um, ineligible trainings, um, they are mostly a lot of those soft skills trainings. So those like time management, teamwork, um, you know, the interpersonal skills. And although we do recognize that those are essential skills needed for employment, um, unfortunately, they're not eligible to be re reimbursed for. Um, okay, so let's go to the second type of training, which is going to be the on the job training. Um, so these are for individuals hired 30 days prior to on or after the award date. Um, if an individual is hired within 30 days prior to the award, the reimbursable training is to begin on or after the award date. Um, so from these definitions, that's going to really be your new employees, right? Um, so those that uh, were promoted into new roles, went from part-time to full-time, that were laid off and rehired, um, or possibly worked for you as a temporary staffing agency, they would not uh, be included on this. Um, this is for work-based learning and trainings that's conducted at the workplace. Um, the point of under the job training is to really help them obtain those skills to become proficient in their new job and should not be used for the low wage, high turnover occupations. Um, so again, uh, under that training is a reimbursement program. Um, so the 90 day retention begins upon the completion of the training and must be completed within one year of the award date. Um, so this is basically saying that um, again, if you hire somebody in December, you wouldn't be able to receive like a 90 day retention for that person because 90 days would probably land around March, let's say, um, and the training uh, and excuse me, and the cycle ended in December. Um, so for the payment purposes, you'll get 50% if your trainee is retained for 30 days, 75 if they're retained for 60 days, and 100 if they have been retained for 90 days following the training completion. So not from their hire date, it's from a training completion. Um, okay, and let's go over the third type, which is apprenticeships. So all apprentices are eligible um, for training funding. So as long as they're active, regardless of what year they are in their apprenticeship, they qualify. Um, an apprentice may be a current employee or a new hire trainee. Um, trainings may be classroom, a combination of classroom and on the job, on the job only, and they can do 100% online training if it is a part of a US DOL um, approved curriculum. So um, you will need to provide a letter uh, attesting that you have an active US DOL apprenticeships, including their occupations. Um, so for individuals that are at risk of not being registered in time to be recognized uh, by the Talent Fund Training Plan, they shouldn't be included in your application. Um, you will need to provide the names um, for the RAPIDS verification, including their RAPIDS ID. Alrighty, so the next one goes over your training funds. So let's go over what's allowable. So that's gonna be actual costs for the classroom training, um, wage reimbursement for new hire on the job training, US DOL registered apprenticeships trainings, uh, classroom training only, on the job training only, or a combination of both the classroom training and on the job training. Um, things that you are not able to use the training funds would be for um, purchases of tools or other equipment like laptops, um, licensing fees, testing fees, curriculum development, travel costs for the trainees, and online subscriptions. Um, all right, so with the training funds, the actual cost of training, so um, the classroom training should not exceed more than $2,000 per trainee. Um, new hire on the job training and classroom training should not exceed $2,000 per trainee. Um, and US DOL registered apprenticeship training should not exceed uh, 3,500 per, per training. So simply put, most of your employees, new or current, um, your maximum is gonna be about $2,000 per employee. And then if it's a US DOL registered apprentice, that's gonna be the 3,500. Um, but you can get a little bit more if you do hire um, from the uh, target in incentives. So that's gonna be $500 extra may be reimbursed to an employer for each new hire who qualifies under one of the categories. 
and make sure you note that bold, the new hires. Uh, so that's going to be your veterans, your active militaries, um, older workers, returning citizens, um, individuals with disabilities, and public assistance recipients. Um, if you have somebody with a high school diploma or equivalency in the path, uh, if they're on that path, uh, they get $1,000. Um, so please know that these are not stackable. So for example, if you have a new hire that is both a veteran and a returning citizen, um, you could not get $1,000 for them. It would be the 500. Um, any questions for me? Man, I must be doing good. Wait, Great. Wait, oh, I do. I one. do have a question. Uh, this is yep. Carrie Henson at Summers. Um, for the, I'm a little confused for the on the job and the apprentice. Is the the on the job? Does it have to be um, approved ahead of time, or the apprentice program approved ahead of time, or is this just something like you hire somebody and you provide them on the job training? Is that qualify? That's a great question. Yes. Yeah. So if it's on the job training, that's eligible for your new employees. Um, it's just not for your current employees. So think right. of it. Yeah. Um, if it's a USCO well registered apprentice, they can be um, a current um, or a new if they're USCO, oh, gotcha. they can receive the adjunct. Okay. Unless I'm wrong. Am I right, Trevor? Nope, that's correct. Okay. But for it. the for the on the job training that they receive, I mean, if it's just regular like showing them how to do the work does that qualify it does yeah okay. then that's okay yeah absolutely okay thank you yeah no thank you great question anybody else okay i want those easy questions you give the harder ones to trevor in this next ones okay so let's go over your uh, employer responsibilities so you must be actively involved in the training plan and the design of the training project. Um, so this should include realistic um, expectations. So we're really going to drill down to the real training needs. So what can be accomplished and still meet your production and other business needs? Um, awardees are accountable to implement the training approved plan. So I always like to highlight this one because um, if you do receive an award and you receive the funds, I've had some employers that it said, you know, realistically, we really couldn't shut down production in order to send these employees to training. So really want to make sure that you understand like the full training needs and what um, can be utilized for this program. Um, it should not be used for those low wage, high turnover occupation. Um, because the expectation is that the training leads to a higher skill and therefore results in higher wages. Um, you will sign a contract or a training agreement with the Michigan Works Agency outlining the employer's roles and responsibilities in the training project. Um, and you'll do that with the SUMCA staff so you do have support um, so you will know exactly what would be required if awarded. Um, at the completion of the training, um, you will be uh, needing to do an impact story that's done online. Um, there should be a commitment to retain employees at the completion of training, um, provide wage um, information prior to training, post-training, and six months post-training. Um, so this is kind of where I said on um, the cycle last year, we're probably going to be in contact with you for about a year and a half, up to two years. Um, we'll be asking for this information. Um, uh, you'll have to provide the required documentation for each reimbursement. Again, this is a reimbursement program. So throughout the cycle, you'll be providing certain documents um, in order to receive the reimbursements for those trainings. Um, provide uh, projected employer's contributions on the application and then confirm the projected or revised contributions post training. Um, that's just an Excel sheet. Again, we'll walk you through that. Um, so application should include calculations such as wages paid during the trainings and the cost of the equipment, um, release time for trainings working through the high school diploma or GED program um, during the work hours that they may be used. Employers should uh, retain uh, supporting documentation for the employer contribution as random audits may occur. So this state just likes to see that the employer is also um, contributing to the employee's success. Um, and so that's um, what it's showing. So anything that is not eligible to be reimbursed for the training program, you can put that amount on this Excel sheet. Um, close out prior, um, close out uh, the year's prior award before receiving the new award, and then commitment to using the Michigan Works and Pure Michigan Talent Connect to recruit for talent to fill your open positions. And with that, I will hand it off to Trevor.
Thank you, Andrea. Um, so here is a kind of a brief outline of the application process. Um, so after today, if you are interested in continuing on with the Going Pro Talent Fund, uh, you will do a fact-finding session with your business services representative that handles your area. Uh, they will meet with you, discuss kind of your business needs, your training needs, um, to see if this program is a good fit for you. Um, if it is, then they will provide you with a link to an online application, which opens October 1st. Um, that is to be completed by you, the employer, but don't worry, we are here to support you. Your BSR will help you through that application. Um, if there's anything they are unable to help you with, we, myself and Andrea, will step in and help you as well. Again, the application period opens October 1st and closes October 18th. Uh, if you do not get your application in on time, uh, you will unfortunately have to wait until cycle two. Uh, the state is very hard and fast on their rules. They will not um, allow any leniency and open your application back up for you. Um, once um, all applications have been tallied and scored, um, training period will start January 1st, 2025 and go to December 31st, 2025. Um, as I said, they score all the applications, they rank them in order from highest score to lowest score, um, and they go down and award until funds are exhausted. So if you are not awarded, um, it's most likely just, I mean, it is because you, you know, your point threshold did not meet um, where it needed to be to be awarded. Completion of an application does not guarantee funding. As Andrea mentioned before, it is a statewide competitive grant, so you are competing against employers all around the state. So now we'll dive into that scoring criteria. Um, so this year, there are a few changes. Um, they are keeping the tiered scoring for the dollar amount requested. Um, so this is you know, something to think about as you're applying and how many funding you're requesting. So if you request $60,000 and under, uh, you would get a total of four points. 60 to 120 is three points. 120 to 180 is two points. 180 to 220 is one point. And 220 or above is zero points. Um, just because you request, you know, above that 220 mark, that doesn't mean that you're not going to get awarded. We do have employers that um, get awarded who request above that. Um, and don't feel like you got to, like, scramble to write all this down. Uh, in the employer guide that was attached to the meeting invite, everything we we're going over today um, is covered in that employer guide and in even more detail. Um, so all of this is in there, the scoring rubric, definitions, what proof needs to be provided, for the various scoring areas and criteria, um, is, it is all in there. Um, if your application includes training directly applicable to infrastructure, electric vehicle, mobility, or related infrastructure, um, the related infrastructure in this category is new this year. Um, so if you're someone who kind of, you know, touches a part of um, like running high-speed internet cable for communities, that's, you know, that related infrastructure, um, you could um, select this category and get points there. Um, for the most part, all of these categories are checkboxes that you, the employer, have to select to get the points. Um, and keep in mind, any area that you get points for, um, you will be required to provide proof that you qualify for those points. Um, the employer, so if you have not received a an award or an ELC award in the past two fiscal years, so that would be 2023 or 2024, uh, you will get points there. I believe this category is automatically um, calculated uh, based off of your, you know, your employer name and address and FBIN. The system will recognize if you've applied before, or it should. Uh, if your business lands in one of these high priority sectors, um, you can select this box to get um, points here. Um, if your business lands in one of the DEI categories, um, you can get points here. So that is if you are a women-owned business, a minority-owned business, um, an individual with a disability-owned business, or if the business lands within an opportunity zone, um, that would score you um, points. Um, if you're unsure if you land in an opportunity zone, um, your BSR has a list of all the cities that qualify. Um, so be sure to check with them and they will let you know if uh, your business is eligible to um, check that box. If you include USDL registered apprenticeship training on your um, application, that will get you points. If you include college credit classes or third party training provider courses, that will get you points. Um, I know a third party training provider sounds a little vague. There is a more in depth um, definition in the employer guide, but that would be those third party training providers that have some type of um, another third party accreditation um, for their trainings. 
Um, the median wages, this hasn't necessarily changed. They've just consolidated the definition as what qualifies for median wage. Um, so this is a very this is a very important category if you select it, because um, this could um, this is tied to a lot of points. Um, and if you don't meet this and you select this box, um, this could have your award rescinded. So I just want to I'm going to read the definition so I don't mess anything up here. But so your hourly median wage must equal must be equal to or above the regional median wage no later than 90 days post training completion. So this is after all training for the award has ended. The verification must be provided or the employer award will not be reimbursed. Um, so if you select that you're going to meet the regional median wage um, 90 days, no later than 90 days post the completion of all of your training, and you don't meet that regional median wage, um, then we would have to rescind your full award. Um, and in an effort to um, in an effort to not have to, I guess, you know, send you reimbursements and then take back money. Um, if you do select this box, um, keep in mind, uh, we will be, you know, we'll collect your documents throughout the year, uh, but then we won't submit a reimbursement until you've completed all of your training and verified that your uh, median wage does meet the regional median wage. Um, I believe the Wayne regional median wage is about $23.50 and the Monroe is about $21.50. Um, it will auto populate when you enter your company address um, and it'll tell you what the regional median wage is for your area. Um, if your application includes technical hard skills training that results in an industry recognized certification or license within the training period. So that would be like if your apprentice um, completes, does a training and they complete all of their training courses and they go and get licensed within um, that training, within that one year training window, um, that would allow you to select this box and get points. Um, if your application includes training directly applicable to creating or preserving affordable housing units, check that box and get points. If your application includes training directly applicable to increasing household access to high speed Internet, check that box and get some points. And then some tiebreaker points to keep in mind um, would be uh, when you're doing your application, if you have fewer than 100 employees on your application, that will get you points. Um, if you're 50% or more, or more are new hires on your application, that'll get you extra points. Um, funding request is no more than $60,000, that'll get you extra points. And if you have that USDL registered apprenticeship on your application, that'll get you points. And these will only come into play if you, um, if it comes to a tiebreaker where you only get down to bottom of um, the points list. Uh, and if you have several employers that all have the same points, then they'll go into these tiebreaker categories to see, you know, who gets the remaining funds. So here's some clarifications on rules. These are things that have been in place um, in prior fiscal cycles, but they weren't very clear in the employer guide. Um, so they've kind of clarified, added some clarifying language um, in the employer guide. So due to the competitive nature of the program, the employers must de-obligate funding linked to the initial application score. If that funding is not being expended for the original pledged intent um, or a major scoring criteria component is not met or improved. So if you select college credit for a course um, and you do not take a college credit course, those funds tied with that college credit course that you initially put on your application um, will be rescinded. So those you select college credit, those funds have to be used for a college credit course. If you don't use them for a college credit course, um, then they just get rescinded. Same thing goes for if you use if you select third party training provider um, and then you not don't end up using um, a verified third party training provider. So that's those training providers who have, you know, another third party accreditation. Um, if you put USDL registered apprenticeship training on your application, you don't train any USDL registered apprentices. Those funds that are associated with that training, those trainings would have to be rescinded as well. Um, and again, that regional median wage. That one's very important. That has a lot of points. If you do select that box and you don't meet that regional median wage 90 days after the completion of all training, um, your whole award would have to be rescinded. Um, earning a certificate or license. So that would be if you, you know, you check that points box for that example I gave where if you had, you know, an apprentice who completed all their, you know, completed their apprenticeship schooling during the um, award period. Um, and they don't end up getting licensed or becoming certified in that 
award period, um, then the points associated with that course would have to be rescinded as well. Again, this is the hourly median wage. Is, that is very, very important. Um, we really want to drive that home. If you select that box, please make sure you're going to meet um, that regional median wage um, post 90 days after completion of all training. Because I really I don't want to take back money. Not fun. Not fun for anybody. Um, they did something new they did change this year. Um, you must submit an application for each physical location you have. In previous years, if you had locations around the state, you could consolidate your application and just submit one application through, say, you had you know applications or you had um, a location on the west side of the state um, and one over in our area in southeast Michigan. You could just do one application for both locations. Um, but now, in an effort to make it more fair, um, they've decided that um, each physical location needs its own application um, because with the geographically disadvantaged points for your physical location, um, you could be, you know, you could qualify for those points in Southeast Michigan, but maybe on the west side, your business does not qualify for them over there. So that was kind of one way that the system could be gamed. Um, so they're trying to make it more fair for everybody. So separate applications for physical locations. So once you've met with your BSR and you've decided this is a good route for you and that the training um, need is there, uh, they will provide you that link, which will bring you to this web page here. Um, if you don't already have a WeBlooms account, you've never done Going Pro in the past, you will most likely need to sign up for a new um, user account here. Use that Sign Up Today link, create a new account. This is your standard you know, user account information. Fill that out. Once you've created an account, select New Authorization Request. Then you'll be filling out information about um, the organization you are applying for, your business. Um, please make sure you enter the name that you want publicly displayed. Uh, if you are awarded here as doing business, and here make sure to put your business name and the name of the city in which you are located. Um, sometimes employers accidentally just put the name of the city, so on the award, um, it sometimes can show up uh, as just the name of the city instead of your business. Remember to select that new authorization request. If you accidentally select existing, you'll have to redo the whole process and submit a new one. Please make sure you select the correct MWA, the Michigan Works Agency you are working with. So you'll be selecting Southeast Michigan Community Alliance, SEMCA. Um, if you are working with us, there is a Michigan Works Southeast, which is not us, um, but that is a common mistake we've had in the past where people select them instead of us. Please make sure you're selecting SEMCA. Um, put the name of the BSR that you are working with here for MWA representative. Here's some more business information about your organization. Here you select if you have a tax obligation or not. Um, if you do know you have one, you can select yes. Um, that would just help you get a jump on getting those tax obligations resolved um, so there's no hang up with your award if you are selected to be awarded. Please put a primary contact here. So this is the person that we are going to be communicating with regularly about your Going Pro Talent Fund award, collecting documents from, um, and all that good stuff. There's also a um, alternative contact information section. Please put an alternative contact. Please don't put your, you know, if you're the primary contact, don't put the primary contact twice. We need an alternative contact in case we can't get a hold of the primary or say the primary leaves um, or is on vacation. Uh, we need someone else to get a hold of. This will be the um, January 1st, 2025 to December 31st, 2025 training dates. Pause here real quick for any questions. We did have one in the chat, Trevor, on um, who would their BSRs be? Um, so if you fill out that um, feedback form that was dropped in the chat, I will also send it out again after the meeting. Um, we will get you connected with the proper BSR. Um, also on the meeting invite, I did attach a like a BSR map. Um, so there is a list of contacts for BSRs for your region um, in that meeting invite, and I will send out all that information again after as well. Um, quick question. Yep. Um, is is there any advantage or disadvantage to turning in the application early in the early in October versus toward the deadline? 
Uh, yes, it makes me really happy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, uh, I mean, if you turn it, the earlier you turn it in, uh, the more time we have to review it. And if there's any like okay. tweaks or anything that need to be made, we can get that okay. back to you in time so you can make adjustments or, um, you know, if there's areas we see like, yeah. oh, you might be able to get some more points or, you know, some things like okay. that. Uh, yeah, smoother. T turning smoother in early, process. so much smoother. Turning in early is always appreciated on our okay. end. Um, Great. Not opposed right, to that. Thank you. Thank yep. you. No further ones in the chat, Trevor. All right, we'll carry on. So this is just a brief outline of what we're about to cover um, as far as the actual application and building out your training plan. Um, so initially you would you'll be entering the names of your training providers that you're going to be using. Um, if you're doing on the job training, you the employer would be the training provider. Um, then you would be entering the names of the courses that you will be using. Uh, thankfully, they have taken off the dates so you don't have to put any specific dates for each training um, because they know right business needs change. Um, trainings may get canceled. Um, so it allows you to, you know, shift around those trainings without having to do a bunch of modifications in the online system, um, which is very appreciative on our end and blessed work for you guys as well. Um, then you'll be entering the number of current employees and new employees that would be taking those that course. Um, and then same for apprentices. If you're doing an apprenticeship, you'd build out um, an apprenticeship course, the number of new or current apprentices taking that course. So this is what this process actually looks like. Um, so when you go in and you've done everything, you've submitted your authorization, we approve you for an application, you click to start your application, it'll bring you to the training provider information page. So this is where you're building out all of the training providers that you plan on using um, during your one year award cycle. So select that type of training provider in here, name of the training provider, city, state, add training provider, and then do that as many times as necessary for all the various training providers you are using. Um, if you're right, if you're doing college credit, you want to make sure you're right, you're selecting that the training provider is a community college or college or university. Or if you're doing USDL registered apprenticeship training, make sure that you know that training provider that you're putting in there, then the type that you're using, you're going to select that apprenticeship training. So then once you've built out all of your training providers in the system, you'll advance to the next page where you're going to be building out all of your training courses. Um, so based off of those training provider lists you just created, you click that drop down. It's going to populate all the training providers you just created. Select the training provider you would like. Type in the name of that course you plan on taking. Select the type of course. So that'd be that classroom customized training, or if you're doing apprenticeship training, USDL registered apprenticeship training. Um, and if you're doing OJT, you would select you as the employer. Um, select the OJT type of training would pop up as OJT here. Type of credential that you're going to be earned from that course. This is important that you select the proper credential because if you accidentally select college credit um, and no one catches it, um, you may even be taking a course at a university, but it's a non-college credit course. Um, so in a, in a review, we might be like, oh, you know, they're taking it at Schoolcraft Community College. They selected college credit. Um, we don't know that it's a non-college credit course, you know, so we think it's good. Prove your application, submit it. You take that course and you go to get reimbursed for it and college credit wasn't earned, then we would not be able to reimburse you for that course because college credit wasn't earned. So please make sure you are selecting um, the right type of credential earned for the course, because if it is tied to points, um, then you have to um, maintain that scoring integrity to be reimbursed. So college credit, make sure you're earning college credit for that course. The training is being delivered, and then you'd be entering the number of new hires taking that course or the number of current employees taking that course. You could have new hires and current taking the same course. Um, and then you will enter the cost per person that you would be getting, re be getting reimbursed for that course as well. So this is the actual cost that the Going Pro Talent Fund will reimburse you for. So if you remember, total cost or total max you can get reimbursed for a new hire or current employee is $2,3500 for a USDL registered apprentice. Um, so if you're putting your employee in a course that costs you $10,000, which is totally fine, 
but you can only get reimbursed for 2,000 of that. So you want to put you know, 2,000 here. And then also to make this process easier, we will also provide you with a, um, a training plan template that you can get working on right away, where you can input all the names of the employees you plan on training, or you can just put some job titles in there if you're not quite sure who's going to take it, just as a placeholder, names of the um, courses across the top, and then you can plug in um, all the prices for the courses in there, and that will help you to fill out this application um, in a much easier, smoother manner. And then if you ever run into any issues while you're filling it out, that training plan template, uh, if you fill it out, will help us um, troubleshoot any issues because we obviously you know, don't know exactly how your training plan is built. So if we have that to kind of look at and versus what you've entered into the online system, that will help us sort out any problems that you run into. And then that will also help you keep it straight to where um, you're not accidentally putting someone in more than that $2,000 or $3,500 um, worth of training. Um, so you may have to, you may be putting in the same course twice, um, but at two different costs. Because say you may have one person who is going through a full $2,000 worth of training, but you may have another person who you know right, doesn't need as much training. They're maybe only going through $1,000 worth of training. Um, so if you're doing welding 101. Um, for, let's say, you know, like two new hires and two current employees, um, and that course is $1,000. You put 1000 in here, but then you have someone else who's doing, you know, $1,500 worth of training, but they also need that welding course. Um, you'd put that welding course 101, one current employee at $500. Um, so you would fill that out um, as many times as necessary. You could duplicate the course based on, you know, if you're reducing costs for employees taking multiple courses. And this is when that training plan template comes in really handy. So once you've done that as many times as it's necessary for all the various courses you are taking, um, then here you're just breaking down those num those trainees that you have on your training plan. So here you're putting the total number of new hires you plan on training, total number of current employees you plan on training. And then these categories here are just a breakdown of these two categories here. So it asks you about like if you have new hires that are earning college credit, put how many are in there, or if you have um, new hire apprentices or current employee apprentices. Then you'll be entering the average hourly wage, and there will also be that median wage category. Um, and that median wage is right if you lined up all of your employees from highest paid on the training plan that you're planning on training, from highest paid to lowest paid, that employee in the middle is your median wage. So that is something to think about as well as you're building out your training plan um, to where you may, you know, reduce the number of employees you're training so that your middle employee um, does meet that regional median wage. So in this section here, um, you're going to be grouping employees by the dollar amount worth of training that they will be going through. So again, that training plan template, if you fill that out, this is going to make life really easy in this section because then you're just going to look all the way over in the right hand column group your you know totals so if you have for example my example here if you have 10 current employees who are taking a thousand dollars worth of training right they could all be taking different courses but they all come out to they're doing a thousand dollars worth of training you're going to select your trainee type you're putting current employees we're going to say they're non-apprentices putting 10 you're going to be training and then you put a thousand dollars for the total amount um, in there and then you do that again say you have five current employees a current employee, non-apprentice, five, um, but then they're taking $2,000 for training. So then you put 2,000 in here, add reimbursement. So then you do that as many times as necessary for all the various different um, dollar amount groups that you have. And then you would save and continue. And then if these two numbers match up on your next page, everything is filled out correctly um, and there should be no issues. If these don't match up, um, most likely, a lot of the errors um, usually come on this reimbursement details page, um, which that training plan template will help you troubleshoot, and it will definitely help us troubleshoot it um, if you need us to step in and help you figure out um, where the issue went wrong or where you went wrong. So then as you move on, then this is where you're going to be putting in that um, employer contribution, um, your projected employer contribution. Um, so it doesn't have to be you know, super accurate, um, just it's what you're projecting, right? It's an estimate. Um, so this is all those costs above and beyond um, that cost of the actual training. So if you're paying your employees 
um, while they're taking training. So those wages, those could be considered um, an employer contribution. Um, if you're providing supportive services for that for your employees while they're doing training, so tuition reimbursement, child care assistance, um, transportation assistance, these are things you can all um, count as your employer contribution. Any questions? Uh, there is none in the chat, Trevor. All right, we will move on. So at the completion of all training, um, to receive reimbursement, you will have to submit some reimbursement documents to us. So we will need that copy of the training provider invoice, um, and that must show the name of the training um, and the cost of the training. Then we will also need documentation for um, each employee. Um, so that would be things like the um, completion certificates for a course, or if they're taking college credit, that would be a transcript showing the grades they received for the course. Um, and keep in mind, if they do fail a course, um, that doesn't prohibit them from being reimbursed. Uh, we would just need proof that they did attend all the full, you know, if there's like several sessions that they attended every single session, um, or if they took, you know, a college credit course that they attended all of their classes. Um, but then we would also need a company invoice to SEMCA. So that would be you, the employer, billing us SEMCA for um, the reimbursement you are requesting. And then from that information, we will fill out a payment request form, um, get it all filled out nice for you so that we'll send it to you and then you just sign it, and date it. Um, and then we will submit that to our fiscal team and they will process the reimbursement and send that out to you. Um, at the completion of all training, uh, we will be collecting what we call our verification form. So that would be all of your employees that you trained throughout the year. We will be collecting, you would enter on there the wage pre-training, their wage post-training, and then, as we mentioned before, then six months after the completion of all of your training, we'll be reaching back out um, for you to enter um, wages six months post-training. Similar process for new hire um, and apprenticeship on the job training. Um, the main difference is we will need a company payroll register query from your payroll system um, or screenshots from your payroll system that are dated at that 90 day retention period. Um, and they must include the name of the employee, the hourly wage, the hire date, um, and if they were terminated um, or if they left, um, that termination date. Um, and then we would collect that company, we would need that company invoice again. So you billing us SEMCA for the amount you're requesting reimbursement for, and then we'll fill out that payment request form, send that to you for signature. Um, and for this company payroll register or query, uh, it can't be a, a report exported into an Excel spreadsheet, unfortunately. Um, that is not an acceptable um, format, according to the Going Pro Talent Fund. Uh, we do need those screenshots. So at the completion of all training, we will be collecting those impact stories, which were mentioned earlier. This is an online form, very simple. We'll send you the link, you fill it out, submit it online, then we're notified that you submitted um, your impact story. Then we can continue on with our closeout process. Any questions on that as we wrap up here? Uh, there's none in the chat, Trevor. All right. So if you could please complete that feedback form, um, letting us know if you are interested in any of the business services that Colleen mentioned earlier, um, or if you're interested in continuing on in the Going Pro Talent Fund process. Um, if you are, we'll get you connected with the, your business service representative, where they'll schedule a time to do a fact-finding meeting with you um, to see what your training needs are um, and how we can best help you meet those through the Going Pro Talent Fund, or maybe potentially some other um, training funds that we may have. Um, if it is appropriate, that BSR will send you that link to the online application, which opens October 1st. Uh, please don't try and start your application October 1st. Uh, it won't, won't work. It may let you like start one, but then you'll still have to start another one. You have to start a new one on October 1st. Um, if you are awarded funding, you will be notified via email, um, and then you will be required to attend a post award session where we'll go into more detail about the reimbursement process and documents that are needed um, and review the training agreement, which we will then send out to everybody to have you sign it and send back. 
Uh, if you are not awarded funding or if you're unsure if the Going Pro Talent Fund is uh, the right fit for you at this time, don't worry, there will be a second cycle offered this year. It will be in the spring. We do not have specific dates for that yet. Um, and please remember you are, may only be awarded one um, award per fiscal year. Uh, so if you do apply in cycle one and you are awarded, uh, you will have to wait until the next fiscal year. But if you are apply, not awarded, you can always apply again um, in cycle two. Again, that application start date is October 1st. Training period will begin January 1st and run until December 31st, 2025. Any final questions here as we wrap up? Uh, none in the chat. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending today's session. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to learn about the, our FY25 application. Uh, if you have any questions that pop up, um, after, please feel free to reach out to me. My contact information there on the screen. Um, please fill out that feedback form um, and everyone have a wonderful rest of your day um, and enjoy this warm weather while it lasts.